when Haley and I were dating, we had a, a policy that, that most of our friends didn't have, and that was we didn't discuss our married life together until we were engaged. Now, that might sound a little strange, but let me tell you what that was. We didn't discuss, like, we didn't discuss the names of our children or, like, what our household chores would be or where we would live or what kind of things we'd want as a married couple until we were engaged because we didn't want to be emotionally connected beyond what we were committed to. Well, so that was great, and Haley was lovely, and it was hard to do because I wanted to spend my life with her. But there was a little bit of, a, of an issue. It really wasn't an issue, but it felt that way in the moment. When it came time for me to actually propose, to actually ask her to marry me, I was very excited, and I was like 99.9% .9 sure that she was going to say yes. I knew it, but I didn't know it because we, hadn't had a con we had not had a conversation beforehand like we want to get married, yes or no. We were going to wait and do that at the engagement. So when I got ready on that, it was a Saturday morning. We were driving back from Thanksgiving there on the border of, of Alabama and Georgia, and I got down to ask that question. I knew that she was probably going to say yes, but I wasn't sure yet. All the signs were there, but I had not had that verbal confirmation. Now, thankfully, when I asked that question, I got the answer that I was excited about and longing for, and it has been wonderful ever since. But it wasn't until I asked her, will you marry me? Did I actually have the confirmation that she indeed would? Have you ever been in a situation like this where you know something, but you don't quite have the confirmation on it yet? Like I'd always heard, I've told the story before, I'll tell it again. I've always heard that Commander's Palace in New Orleans has the best turtle soup in the world. And I knew that because everyone had told me that Commander's Palace has the best turtle soup ever. But I couldn't confirm it until about four years ago we got the opportunity to eat at Commander's Palace and eat turtle soup. And indeed it was the best turtle soup in the world. But if you've been in that situation where you know something, but you just, you're not sure, all the signs are there, but you don't have that confirmation, that set in stone, well, that's where, our, where the disciples find themselves today. In our text last week, Peter um, confessed before the disciples when Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? He said, you are God's Messiah. You are the Christ, the one who is coming to fix what is broken, to fix our sin problem, to be our king. He said that. He had seen all the signs. He heard that Jesus had said these things, had professed these things through his teachings and his miracles. He knew what the prophet said in the Old Testament about the Messiah. He knew it, but yet there wasn't that like, yes, I am conversation where Jesus confirmed it. Well, today we're going to see that confirmation. In our text today, we will see that Jesus was transfigured before Peter, James, and John, showing those three disciples that he indeed was God, and he was the one chosen to fulfill his plan for saving the world. And if you get nothing else today, this is the big idea. Hold on to this. Because Jesus is God, because Jesus is the Messiah, we can trust him, and we can trust his plan for salvation. If you get nothing else from this message this morning, know this, that because Jesus is God, because he is the Messiah, we can trust him and we can trust God's plan for saving us. I hope that we will learn from God's word today that we'll be challenged and grown. Let's pray one more time and then we're going to read the text. Lord, we are so thankful for your word, thankful for the way that it shows us who you are, that it shows us how to live. Lord, today as we spend time in your word, would you help us? Lord, guide our hearts and our minds. Lord, help us to block out the distractions of this week ahead or the week behind, but help us to focus even just for a few moments on your word and how it challenges us to live. Lord, we thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. This is God's word from Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 28. God's word says this, about eight days after this conversation, he took along Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Peter and those who were with him were in a deep sleep. When they became fully awake, they saw his glory, and the two men were standing with him. As the two men were departing from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us set up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. 
not knowing what he was saying. While he was saying this, a cloud appeared and overshadowed them. They became afraid as they entered the cloud. Then a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my Son, the Chosen One. Listen to Him. After the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. They kept silent and at that time told no one what they had seen. This is the Word of the Lord. And we thank God for it. Today we'll see three things. We'll see the change that took place, the conversation that was being had, and the command from the Father to us. Let's look at the change. As we dive into this text, we see that it's eight days later, some time after, about a week, after this conversation where Jesus has talked with his disciples, asked them, who do the crowd say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And he said, if anyone wants to come after me, if you want to be my disciple, you have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. So about a week after that, Jesus goes off alone with his disciples to pray, and he takes three disciples. He takes Peter, James, and John to do what he often did. We read this, we've talked about this already in Luke, that Jesus gets alone by himself to spend time in prayer. And here, this is the second time we see this group of disciples forming. This is his inner circle. These are the three disciples that Jesus took in with him to Jairus' house to heal his daughter. So Jesus goes up on the mountain with his inner circle of disciples to pray. And as they got up on the mountain, something incredible takes place. As Jesus is praying, his external characteristics begin to change. There is a shift that takes place. As he's praying, something happens that hasn't happened before. Luke keeps it very simple, very straightforward, very to the point. He says his face changed. His face changed. But if you look in the other accounts, Matthew and Mark also tell us about this event. In Matthew, we read that Jesus' face began to shine like the sun, that that light radiated out of his face, that there was something unique going on here, that his countenance appeared glorious. Luke tells us that not only that his face changed, but also that his clothes, the things he was wearing, began to change. They were transformed. They were dazzling white. I like the way Mark tells us. Mark says that his clothes were such that no launderer could get them that way. Mark wants to tell us that his clothes were so white that even the person who's a professional at washing clothes couldn't get them that white. This was no sleight of hand. This wasn't an extra change of clothes that Jesus had stashed up here on this mountain to trick his disciples. This was something that was happening that had never happened before. This was Jesus revealing the glory of God that was present with him. Jesus is showing his disciples who he is. He is appearing in His glory to confirm that He indeed is the Messiah. That He indeed is who Peter said He was. We've heard about things like this before. In the Old Testament, we read about those who met with the glory of God, revealed in like the burning bush when Moses met God there. Or the glory of God that led the people of Israel through the wilderness that rested on the tabernacle and then rested on Solomon's temple. We read about the glory that filled the temple of Isaiah and his vision in chapter 6 of his book. And throughout the scriptures we also read about those who have spent time in the glorious presence of God. Moses, when he received the second set of stone tablets, when he was up on the mountain for 40 days with God, When he came back down, it says that his face shone with the glory of God. It shone so brightly that it scared the people in the camp with him so that Moses wore a veil over his face as to not frighten those who he led. We read about the angels who were at the tomb on the day that Jesus rose from the dead. They were just, they're described as men, but their clothes, that they said, shone like lightning. They were bright. There was a glorious weight about them because they had been in the presence of God. But unlike Moses and unlike the angels, there's something different about Jesus and him appearing this way. You see, all those other people shone because they had been in the presence of God, but Jesus shines and displays glory because he is God. When we see Jesus on the mountain transfigured his face shining like the sun his clothes so white that no launderer could get them that way when jesus is transfigured before us we see him in his glorious condition as god jesus is showing his glory because he is god 
This is not something external acting upon him, but this is him revealing who he truly is to these three disciples in that place. Peter was right. He really is God's Messiah. He's the one chosen. He is God himself. Friends, because Jesus is God, because Peter's confession is true that Jesus is the Messiah, the one who God has chosen to fix the sin problem, because all that is true, because Jesus is God, we can trust him. Because Jesus is God, revealed in glory here, we can trust him. When he speaks, we should listen. When he acts, we should take notice. When he calls us to do something, we should do it. Because Jesus is God, there is a different kind of weight on his words than the words of any other human. We have friends, family, neighbors, wise people who have walked with the Lord for a long time that can give us true insight into the Christian life. We talked about this in Sunday school this morning. But friends, when Jesus speaks, he speaks with a different kind of authority than your godly mother or grandmother speaks. When Jesus speaks, he speaks as God. The author, the creator, the giver of life, who is in himself holy and righteous. Jesus, on the Mount of Transfiguration, is displaying that he truly is the second person of the Trinity, equal with the Father and the Spirit, eternally God forever. He is the one who has been sent to save and ransom humanity from our sins, that we might dwell in the presence of God forever. So there's a change. But next, look at the conversation that happens. As Jesus is displaying His glory uh, as of the Father in heaven, He is transfigured. He's got a dazzling appearance. His face is shining like the sun. But not only that, but there is a conversation happening. In verse 31, we get a picture of what's going on. It says, and suddenly, this is verse 30, two men were talking with Him, Moses and Elijah, and their appearance in glory and they were speaking of, speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. It's a little bit curious to me, although it probably shouldn't be curious, that this glorious occasion was the setting for a conversation. Well, I guess it shouldn't be curious because it's only because of the glory of God that this conversation should happen, right? Moses and Elijah were there on the mountain with Jesus. Moses, the guy who led the people of God out of slavery in Egypt through the Exodus, through the Red Sea that we read about earlier. Moses, the guy who, who was the, the lawgiver, the one who went up on the mountain and received the, the commandments, the law of God. Elijah, the man who spoke for God as a prophet during the time of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, who called down fire from heaven on a sacrifice there on Mount Carmel, showing the power of God and putting to shame the prophets of Baal. These two men lived hundreds of years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Not only did these two men live hundreds of years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but these two men lived hundreds of years apart in their own time. Here it is only through the power of God, through the glory of God being revealed, that these two men could be described as being here on earth, having a conversation with Jesus in the first century in the land of Israel. A land that, mind you, Moses never went into. He only saw it before he died. But why these two men? Why is Jesus talking to Moses and Elijah? What What's the significance of these two guys? They were great men of the Scriptures, right? But why specifically these two guys? As I was thinking about this, I was reminded of what many pastors and theologians and Bible teachers have said about this, have pointed out here. You see, Moses was not just a great leader of Israel. He was not just the guy who led the people of of Israel out of Egypt, who was the one who spoke with Pharaoh during the times of the plagues, who was the one who was there at the first Passover. But Moses, as he is remembered, is really remembered as the one who brings about the law. Moses was the man who God chose to reveal the law most fully to. Moses is the one who went up on Mount Sinai and spent 40 days with the Lord, and God instructed him in the law, who gave him the Ten Commandments written on two stone tablets, who instructed him on how to build a tabernacle and what the sacrificial system was supposed to be. Moses was remembered and is remembered as the person who brought about the law. He's the lawgiver. 
As a matter of fact, we refer to the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, the books of the law, sometimes as the law of Moses. Such that someone might say, Moses taught us in reference to what the law says. Moses really does represent the law. The picture of God's righteousness and love towards his people. So we've got Moses, the law, we've also got Elijah here. Elijah was a prophet, and if you really think about it, he was the the model of a prophet. When you think about a prophet, someone who speaks for God, who, who utters things and speaks hard messages before kings and rulers and peoples, this was the guy. Elijah was a rugged man who spoke a hard message in the darkest days of Israel's history. Elijah was a prophet at a time when Israel, even their king and their queen, had turned from the worship of the true God and instead were worshiping idols and making sacrifices to Baals. Indeed, Elijah, for his prophecy, for what he said, was being hunted down and they were seeking to to kill him because he was speaking for the Lord. When you think about a prophet, someone who speaks for God, who calls the people of God to turn from their sins and, and be united with God, to return to the worship of the true God, to restore their relationship. Elijah is that guy. I mentioned it last week. Elijah is so much the picture of a prophet that to this day an Orthodox Jewish person when they're celebrating the Passover will set an extra plate at the table, pour an extra glass of wine, and that is Elijah's chair for they expect that Elijah will return before the Messiah comes. Elijah is the picture of the prophet. So you might be saying, Daniel, I get you know, who Moses was, I get who Elijah was, but why are they here on the mountain talking with Jesus? And if I can propose something to you this morning, you check me on this, I'm not proposing to be 100% right, though I think I am. Moses and Elijah are here talking with Jesus because Jesus is about to fulfill their ministry. The ministry of the law, this is not my idea, others have said this, The ministry of the law was to show the people of God his righteous standard. In the law, we see the righteousness of God laid out, the rules by which people are to live if they're going to be in relationship with God. We see his love for his people, acknowledging that they're going to fail. He gives them the sacrificial system to atone for their sins. And Jesus, in his death, burial, and resurrection, is about to fulfill completely the law. Not to do away with it, but the law is going to find its perfection in Jesus' sacrifice for us. The prophet's ministry, the ministry of Elijah and the rest of the prophets was to call the people of God back to worship with God, to be reconciled with God, to be made one with God again. In Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, He has finally secured that union again. Because of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, humankind is able forevermore to be united with God, to have a relationship with Him, to be His people. The ministry of the law and the ministry of the prophets is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ, in His death, burial, and resurrection. That's why these two men appear and are talking with Jesus about His departure. So friends, because Jesus is God, He's revealed in glory, He's talking to Moses and Elijah, We should recognize that Jesus is Lord of all. Lord of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Friends, lest we think there is a different God for the Old Testament and a different God for the New Testament, we see here that Jesus, being very God of very God, is talking with Moses and Elijah. He has come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. For we have one God, holy and righteous, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Reveal this Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Jesus Christ in His earthly ministry has fulfilled God's righteousness. Has shown us Himself. Has fulfilled the law and the prophets. For He is our prophet, priest, and king. Our God is the one who gave the law to Moses. Our God is the one who spoke through the prophet Elijah to King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. Our God is the one who has saved us and beckons us to come to Him and be saved. We've seen the change. We've seen the conversation. Now look at the command. 
look with me at what happens afterwards in verse 33. It says, as the two men were departing from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let's set up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Not knowing what he was saying. Peter here is just filling air as Peter does. He, he is not good with silence, apparently. So he just blurts out, Lord, it's good to be here. He just has to fill the air with something, but that's really not what it's about. And here it says, the cloud appeared and overshadowed them, and they became afraid. But then a voice came from a cloud saying, this is my son. This is the second time that we have heard the voice of the Father speaking in the book of Luke. Back in chapter 3, when Jesus was baptized, fulfilling the, the, the instruction for his people, it says the heavens opened as he came up out of the water. The Spirit descended in the form of a dove, and the Father spoke and said, What? This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Well, here in chapter 9, we hear the voice of the Father one more time. It says, A cloud overshadowed them, and the Father spoke. He said, This is my Son. The Father confirmed what Peter had said just a few verses ago, that indeed Jesus is the Son of God. And if Jesus is the Son of God, He is equal with God. He says that He truly is God, the One who is coming, the Messiah, the One who is going to fix the sin problem once and for all. But not only does the Father confirm Jesus' identity as His Son, He also tells Him that He is the Chosen One. This is My Son, the Chosen One. He is the Messiah, the One who has been selected for the task of redeeming the world. The one who is at work in humans, saving us from our sins and beginning the kingdom of God. He is the Messiah who's going to fix what has been broken, to heal that which is sick, to save which that is lost. Not only is He the chosen one, not is He the Son of God, but the Father gives us this instruction. And He gives it in no unclear terms. Look at it there in your Bibles. Verse 35, this is my son, the chosen one. Listen to him. The father didn't leave any room for misinterpretation. He gives us a very clear application. When Jesus was transfigured, when he was shown in glory as God, having a conversation with Moses and Elijah about his death, fulfilling their ministry, Jesus being very God is affirmed as the Son of God by the Father, is affirmed as the Messiah, the Chosen One, and here we are instructed to listen to Him. We talked about this a little bit last week. If we believe that Jesus is God, then we should listen to Him. We should obey His words. If He is indeed God, if His words really are the words of life, then we should be willing to suffer and die for honoring Him. Well, today the Father says this in no unclear terms. Jesus is God. So when Jesus speaks, God speaks. And if Jesus is God, then He has the right and the authority to tell us what to do and how to do it. So when Jesus speaks, we ought to listen. In obedience to the Father, we ought to listen to Jesus. We ought to pay attention when He speaks. But if anyone has has taught children before, you know that the word listen means different things to different people, right? Listening has a lot of different levels. On one level, listening is like hearing, right? Hearing is just acknowledging that someone's making noise and paying attention. Listening on another level is understanding that someone is trying to communicate with you. Listening is understanding that someone is trying to tell you something. Listening is understanding that there is a concept being communicated to you, and you are trying to understand it. But there's another level to listening, right? When your parent says, listen to me, they're not just telling you to hear the voice, to hear, their, hear the noise they're making. They're not just telling you to understand what they're telling you. What are they telling you to do? To obey. They're telling you to take in what I'm telling you, And then do it. When the Father says, 
This is my son, the chosen one. Listen to him. He's not just saying, hear the noises that are coming out of his mouth. He's not just saying, try to take in his concepts. No, he's saying, obey him. Hear what he says and do it. Listen to Jesus. He is God. He is worthy of our obedience. So, we should listen to Jesus. When Jesus says, if anyone wants to come after me, if anyone wants to be my disciple, they must do three things, right? Deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Not live for themselves, be willing to suffer, and go wherever I lead. When Jesus says to his disciples, if anyone has wronged you, forgive them not seven times, but 70 times seven times. Forgive them endlessly as God in Christ has forgiven you. When Jesus says, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. Instead, lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. When Jesus says that, we listen. When Jesus says, as we're going to read in just a few minutes, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, we ought to listen. These are not suggestions. These are not just words uttered into the void. These are the commands of God Himself, and we are instructed in no uncertain terms to listen and obey. Don't miss this. Because Jesus is God, He is worthy of our trust, of our obedience, and of our lives. Because Jesus is God, we should take seriously the things that He says to obey Him. We should also take very seriously what is said about Him. He says, Come unto Me, all you who are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take My yoke upon you for My burden is easy and my load is light. We should take very seriously the Word of God as Paul tells us that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Friends, the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus is is presently building His kingdom. He has invited us to be a part of it. He has called us to forsake our sins and our pleasures and our passions that that lead us toward ourselves and instead turn towards Him, trust in Him, and we will be saved. The application is simple. The Father's Word says it. Listen to Jesus. So friends, the call for you today is this. I call you friends because that is what I believe you are. And as your friend, I have to tell you something important. I've said it before. Jesus is God. And He is worthy of our trust and of our obedience. Maybe you're here today and you know Jesus is God, that He is worthy of your trust and your obedience, but there is something in your life. You know Jesus is God and you know He is telling you to do something, but you're not doing it. You're running from it. You are disobeying God's command to listen to Jesus. Maybe you're here today and and you're doing something and you know Jesus says, don't do that. Instead of listening to Him, you're running from Him. The call on your life today, friend, is to come to Jesus. For in Him there is forgiveness. There is hope. There is mercy and peace. Maybe you're here today and you realize that you don't know this Jesus. Maybe you know about him. Maybe you've listened to him. You've like heard things about him. You've heard his teaching, but you've never obeyed him. You've never put your faith in him. Today, the call is this. Cry out to God. Ask him to save you, and he will. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand and sing. And I'm not going to stand at the front like I normally do, but I do want you to know this. If you need to come and do business with God... You can do that in your seat where you are. But we're going to sing a song called Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And there's a line in there. It says, Here I raise my Ebenezer. And Ebenezer is a Hebrew word for a stone of remembrance. It's a a monument that the people of God built when they wanted to remember what God has done. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If God is speaking to your heart now, 
If he's asking you to turn from something you're doing and turn toward him, or maybe it's to put your faith in him for the first time, I want to invite you to get out of your seat and come and pray here at the front. This isn't so we can look at you, but it's so that you make a commitment that you want to remember to to place your faith in Christ here today. I want to challenge you one more way, even more extreme. If you need to do business with God today, I want you to tell someone about it. If you want to, my phone number's on the back of the bulletin. Send me a text, give me a call, and we can talk on the phone or in person. And I want to encourage you and pray with you and help you to live in the life that God's called you to as we seek together to listen to Jesus because He is God. And he's worthy of our trust and obedience. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to respond. Father, we thank you so much for everything you have given to us, the ways that you are working in our lives for your glory and for our good. Lord, thank you for the transfiguration. Thank you for the gift of the confirmation that you are God, that Jesus is is God, that He is worthy of our trust. Lord, today I am keenly aware that there are places in my life where I don't listen to You as I should. Lord, maybe I hear it, maybe I understand it, but I haven't obeyed. Lord, forgive me. Forgive us. Help us, Lord, to walk in obedience, for you are worthy of our trust. Lord, help us to obey both now and in the week to come. Lord, we love you and we thank you. And we ask this all in Jesus' name so we know you hear us.